Mark chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1. It says this, When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that, they were, that, so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. So Capernaum is like a fishing town. It's where Peter's from. Most theologians actually would say, when it talks about him being at a home, that it was actually Peter and Andrew's home, or, or maybe just Peter's home. We, we don't really know, but what we do know is that he's in a rural, blue-collar community named Capernaum. So if I can just bring it into 2024, he's in Pearl River, okay? That's where he's at. That's where he's at, okay? And What's happening in this moment is he's teaching, and it's blowing everybody's minds because he's teaching with authority. He's teaching with power that they've never seen, that they don't know anything about. The scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, they were experts at religious law, but they did not have that type of authority because he is the Son of God, right? And so he's teaching, and his house that he's at is slam full. So Jesus is teaching, and all these people are there. It's basically like a life group that has exploded, and they came and get through the door, That's what's happening in these first two verses. And the first person that we're introduced to in this story is in verse 3. And it says this, And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. I want to introduce you to the first person in the story. It's the paralytic. And you're like, well, how could I relate? I'm, I'm able to walk. But let me tell you, in every community, in every church, in every work setting, In every place you'll ever be, there's always somebody who's in need, okay? Someone who's in need. And I'll be transparent this morning. Sometimes in my life, it's been me. I'm the one that's in need. And I need somebody to bring me to the one who can change everything. I need somebody to bring me. Maybe you're here this morning and you're that person in need. Maybe you're battling depression. Maybe you've been struggling with anxiety. Maybe you've experienced loss. You might feel alone. You might be struggling to pay bills. But here's the thing. Being in the house of God is the right place to be. Here's the thing. You can come in here and not be okay, but we don't want you to leave that way. We want you to experience him because he will change everything. All right? We're also introduced in this story to people who care. All right? They came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. It says this in verse 4. Being unable to get him because of um, being able to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. These friends, these four blue collar friends, would stop at absolutely nothing to get their friend to Jesus. Okay, how was he going to get there if they didn't bring him? He wasn't. It took people that cared about him enough to inconvenience themselves. Listen, I want to tell you this morning. Some of you. You're trying to get family, friends, coworkers to come to Jesus, and it's exhausting. Your arms are spiritually tired like these men were. You're, you're spiritually sweating. You're, you're, it's hard. It's heavy. But let me tell you something this morning. It takes one time in the presence of Jesus. It takes one encounter with Jesus. It takes one word from the King of kings and Lord of lords to change everything. Don't give up. Don't give up. I mean... They get there, and they're trying to get there, and, and, and they have obstacle after obstacle, right? What's interesting, though, is their house, it says they were slammed full. So they've taken this man, who's their friend, and they're walking down the road, and they're trying to get to him. And in their minds, they're like, we just need to get him to Jesus. And they get there, and immediately there's an obstacle. It's too crowded. I'm going to tell you something about Middle Eastern culture. See, I've, I've been to Israel. And when the door is open in Middle Eastern culture, which it almost always is, it's an invitation to come in. Come in, do do life with us, do meals with us, have conversation with us. This door was probably open, but they could not fit this man in because of the crowds. Uh, Explain a little bit about the homes that we're talking about here, how they could get to the roof, because you're not exactly getting to the roof in most modern-day homes. You're not. But in these homes, these Middle Eastern homes, They were sealed, the walls were sealed with basalt, which is a dark volcanic rock sealed in a certain way. The roofs would have beams about three feet apart, and between these beams they would put straw and clay and manure. When it rained, the clay would absorb the water packed into the manure and seal the roof. And a lot of times grass would grow on it. 
So they have taken this man, no telling how long, no telling how hard, they're tired, they're sweaty, and they get to the place where like, we just need to get him to Jesus, and there's an obstacle. There's an obstacle. And listen, when you're trying to bring your friends and family to Jesus, when you're trying to bring those people you, you're working with to Jesus, there will always be an obstacle. I will tell you that. And in that moment, Satan's going to come in and he's going to say, man, you should quit. Look, you carried them all this way for nothing. Now you can't even get in. You can't get to see Jesus. And even if you saw Jesus, nothing would change. You need to stop and turn around. But I want to tell you, if you're taking notes, write this down. If we let the obstacles stop us, we miss the miracle God has for us. Again, if we let the obstacles stop us, we'll miss the miracle that God has for us. These four friends found a way. The conventional way, the traditional way, was to walk through the door. What they did was unconventional. It was untraditional. It was dirty. It was sweaty. It was stinky. I mean, they're digging through clay and manure, with grass, bugs, everything else. Because they would stop at nothing to get their friend to Jesus. I want to ask you, when's the last time you took the attitude when you're trying to reach somebody? I don't care how dirty it gets for the kingdom, I'm going to do it. I don't care how messy and disgusting I have to become, I'm going to reach this person for the Lord. And I believe this, sometimes the reason we don't see people come to Jesus is because we won't do whatever it takes to get them there. All right, Tradition is that we walk through the door. They couldn't get to the door, so they climbed on the roof and they dug and lowered their friend down. When you see all this stuff with these camps, I want you to understand our heart with things. We as a church, in True Life Church, we're going to innovate for Jesus. That's why we do ministry. It might look unconventional. It might look untraditional. It might even go against some man-made traditions. However, like you see in the story, it pleases the Lord, and that's what matters. We are God-pleasers, not people-pleasers. Craig Rochelle wrote this, and I've been chewing on it for over a decade. He said, in order to reach people that no one is reaching, you have to do things that no one is doing. You have to do it. And these men took a different approach. Now, and I'll tell you, I didn't even tell this in the first service, but as I've been studying these scriptures and preparing for this message, I didn't realize the Lord was going to do that very same thing to me. Uh, if you follow me on Facebook, you saw what happened last night. We were led in my MMA gym to start doing a thing to reach our lost teammates and fighters in that gym and and one of the things that we did we started it last night we didn't know who was going to come didn't know what was going to happen didn't know what it's going to look like but they were like you're a pastor you're going to lead I'm like okay let's do it so I started preparing a message it was this message by the way um, i had already prepared it and I knew the Lord had it in store and 20 men showed up and, and I'm sitting around and I'm like this is the most unconventional thing because I got people that are in the medical field and people with more felonies and letters in their name. And, and look, and we're all sitting there, and for an hour straight, we dug into the Word of God. And I, and I got to explain to them the gospel. They'd never heard it before. And here's the thing. One of them told me, he says, I've never been to church. I don't fit. I'm like, and it hit me. I'm like, that was this man. He didn't fit. And I was like, and I stopped right in the middle of me teaching last night to these grown men. I said, listen to me right now. You might not fit in traditional ways, but I'm willing to dig through a roof to get you to Jesus, dude. And he was like, he was like oh. And then like, I remember I'm, I'm looking around, and all these men are misty-eyed. And I'm like, and one of the guys said, I've struggled with addiction, and I was looking at 10 years in prison. And I've been coming to this gym, and what I see in this gym is community. I'm like, okay. And I said, hey man, I want you to come to Jesus too. I want to bring him, I want to bring you to him. And it's probably going to look a lot different than it would on Sunday mornings. But you have a seat in my church anytime. And he was like, absolutely. One of my 40-year-old friends, he said this, he goes, listen, in this place, I've never experienced Jesus. He said, reading this, this gospel and talking about this Bible study, I've never been saved. He goes, I don't go to church. I've never had this opportunity. He said, but I want this. I said, what? He said, yeah, I want this. This is different than everything I've heard. And I said, because it's the gospel, dude. And the gospel's not about bondage. It's about freedom. It's about freedom. So, and, and, and I think about these four men, right? They're blue-collar guys. They're from Pearl River, right? You know, they're, they're those guys. They're sitting around and, and Think of the conversation that must have ensued to get them to Jesus, right? You got four men probably eating breakfast at Mama's Kitchen, you know, in Pearl River. 
So all the people probably were like, yeah, we know. So they're eating there, and all of a sudden, we read in Mark chapter 1 about the miracles he was doing. One of the guys looks over, and he says, hey, man, I heard that Jesus of Nazareth, he healed a leper. Like in Leviticus, in the law, it says a Jewish man can't touch a leper because we'll be unceremonially clean. But Jesus met a leper, and the leper walks up, and Jesus touched him. And Jesus didn't become unclean. The leper became clean. This is wild. That means he has power that we know nothing about. He must be the son of God. What, this is crazy. And then another one, drinking his coffee, looks over and he says, wait a second. I heard that Jesus cast out demons. That when Jesus speaks, demons run. When Jesus speaks, strongholds that Satan has on people's lives are broken. Man, this must be the son of God. And then the next person, the third person goes, hey, listen, our friend, he can't walk. Maybe if we bring him to Jesus, Jesus can heal him and restore him. And then the fourth friend says, darn straight. But he probably didn't say darn because he didn't know Jesus yet. All right. <laughs> and so they make this plan. And I want to tell you, especially you youth here, listen, you want to know who your true friends are? It's the ones that stop at nothing to get you to the feet of Jesus. Again, sometimes the reason we don't see people come to Jesus is because we don't, take, we don't do whatever it takes to get them there. The third people you see in this, in this passage is this. It's the crowd, and they're the preoccupied people. They're the ones in, in the life group, in the home group, and they're studying, and they're listening, and they're hearing Jesus speak. But inadvertently, because of their body language, they've turned around to the very person in need. What they've said, even though they would never do this, what they've said is, we don't care about you. We don't care about you. You know, and look, these guys are good people. Like, they would be people that are only listening to Caleb. They got the Christian bumper stickers, you know. They're the people who are in their holy huddles, like Pastor Mike says. You know, they're hanging out, they're doing good things, but they've missed the very one that Jesus wanted to save outside their doors. Man, me, we as a church can never be like that. Look, I look forward to the time when we're so full in these services where there's no more seats and we have guests come in and I just tell people, say, guys, let's all sit on the floor so they got room. We'll do untraditional ways and unconventional things so that people might know Jesus because he changes everything. Let's keep going, though. Verse 4, it says this, being unable to get him get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was, la was laying. So I want to I show you something. They did it. It wasn't one of them. It was all four of them. Why is that significant? Listen, for us to be effective in reaching people for Jesus and bringing them to the feet of Jesus, it takes all of us. It's not just the pastor's. Can you imagine if it's just me as a pastor up here trying to get the man that can't walk to Jesus? I'm literally going to be having him on a rope on a pallet trying to drag him upstairs. It's going to be like, duh, 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 duh. I mean, it's going to be bad. I'm going to get up there, and it's going to take me forever to dig this hole. And once I'm filled with all the manure and the clay and nastiness, and I get a hole big enough for him to get down, it's just me, and I would be lowering him down and struggling so bad that he wouldn't fall. Can you imagine how heavy that would be? It'd be like this, all the way down, and I'm telling you, I know myself, I would drop him, all right? It would be just like this, like, he's already paralyzed, what's that's going to happen, right? You know, like, <laughs> it just, that would be me, but I'm not supposed to just be me. It's supposed to be all of us, all right? It's supposed to be all of us working together for the kingdom, fighting against the enemy, pushing back the forces of darkness. It's all of us together. We're all called. We're all commissioned. We're all commanded. It's all of us. Verse 5, this is the reason that we do what we do and the ways that we do ministry here. This is the reason we do fall fest. This is the reason we do unconventional ways. It's the reason that we do the firework shows. This statement right here. Verse 5, and Jesus, seeing their face, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. That moment right there, that's it. When I sit around those group of MMA fighters, that's the moment I want them to come to. 
When you're thinking about that loved one who doesn't know Jesus, that's it right there. That they would get their sins forgiven and enter into a relationship with him. Because our sins, if we're not forgiven, stand in front of us and we are absorbing wrath day by day in front of a holy, perfect God. And he's so holy that when every time somebody sees him in scripture, they fall down like they're dead and they say, you are too much, I'm a dead man. That is our God. And if you have not had your sins forgiven, you will stand in front of him guilty. If you had, then what he looks at you, if you've been saved, if you've been forgiven, he doesn't see your, your sin anymore. He sees his son who is perfect and the sacrifice that he made on the cross. And he looks at you and says, justified, come on in. That's the reason we do what we do. And it says, it's interesting, he says, and when Jesus saw their faith, how do you see someone's faith? By their actions. By their actions. Now, what's interesting about this, this part, though, these four men brought their friends to Jesus, or brought their friend to Jesus for what? So that he could walk. They, he needed physical healing. They brought him there, but Jesus did not give him physical healing. He gave him spiritual healing. He gave him forgiveness of sins. If you're taking notes, write this down. This is because sometimes God gives us what we need before he gives us what we want. He gives us what we need before he gives us what we want. I'm telling you right now, some of you might be there right now. You've been asking God for all this, and it's just not happening. And God's saying, hold up, you don't need that. You need this, and I'm going to give you what you need first. But I want to explain something about these miracles that Jesus does. All of the miracles that Jesus does, this man's crippled nature on the outside was a reflection of his crippled nature on the inside. All right? He is lame spiritually, and he needs to be restored to God. These people that he heals of blindness were blind spiritually. Ephesians tells us that. These people that he raised from the dead were dead spiritually. Because Ephesians 2 tells us you were once dead in your trespasses and your sins, but thank God he's made you alive in Christ. All of these are what's happening spiritually. And he's saying, listen, when I heal blind eyes, when I raise up people from the dead, it's showing what I'm going to do for you spiritually. Spiritually. You see these people in every church, community, gathering. There's someone in need. There's someone that cares. There's someone who's preoccupied. And unfortunately, the last person that we're going to look at in the text is someone who's critical. Verse 6. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Listen. These people would be so upset in this moment. You're going to find people, when you're walking in the Spirit and you're doing what God has called you to do, there's going to be people that are upset because you're going to break man-made traditions. These guys would have sat there and been like, man, we are so upset that, that this guy has came through the roof. You know, the doors open for a reason, man. The doors have worked in, in churches for all this time. They need to walk through the doors, but it pleased Jesus to open the roof up. Why? Because what they've unintentionally did is they put Jesus in a box. And they said, he's only going to go there. But here's the thing, there wasn't room enough for him. There wasn't room. So hear my heart, true life. That in the heart of the staff here is we'll open every roof so that there's people, there's enough room for people to come to know and love Jesus. That's what we're going to do, all right? There's always going to be people that are offended, and they will sit back and, and they'll say this kind of stuff. And we're always going to say, well, we're going to innovate for Jesus. We're going to do things that no one's doing because we want to reach people that no one's reaching. You know? What's interesting is in verse 8, Jesus didn't let the criticism stop him. It says this, Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within, within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? So Jesus calls them out. like He reads their minds. He's like, I know what y'all are thinking. And you know how to know that you're religious? You know how to know, because listen, if you call me religious, I'm deeply offended because I'm not religious. I have a relationship with the Almighty God, and that changes everything, okay? You know how to know you're religious when you'd rather care about the traditions that are broken rather than this guy being saved. That's how you gauge if you're religious. These people were religious. They cared more about the traditions that were broken than this broken man being healed spiritually. Right? So Jesus knows their hearts. He comes after them. Verse 10. I'm oh, sorry, verse, verse 9. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, 
your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up his pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were, they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So Jesus does a couple things in this moment, okay? He's silencing the critics. He's showing that this man's greatest need is also ours great, our greatest need, which is to be healed spiritually and the forgiveness of our sins. He's showing that the religious people, he's showing them, hey, listen, I have all authority on heaven and earth. There's nothing that I cannot do, and I am God. Again, he's telling them, I'm giving you what you need before I give you what you want. Yeah, he healed them physically, but his real need was spiritual. Just like our real need is always spiritual, okay? But it's interesting, the last part after he heals them, he says everybody's amazed. He tells this man, he basically says, now take up your mat and go home. You don't need that anymore. I just changed your life. One encounter with Jesus will change your life. So as Cammie comes up and plays, I want to ask you some questions this morning. See, God may be speaking to you right now. He may be telling you, take up your mat and go home. You don't need that thing anymore. You, you might say, but Pastor Clay, I'm helpless this morning. But I want to tell you that his power, by his power, you can walk away right now from that addiction. Okay? By his spirit, you can be set free from that stronghold. Take up your mat. That might mean for you this morning, lay down those drugs because you don't need them anymore. Lay down that addiction because you don't need it anymore. Lay down your insecurities about stepping out in faith over this situation because Christ is enough. Lay down those burdens because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Lay down your fear because God has not called you to a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's not your crutch anymore. By his spirit, you have the same power that God has raised Christ from the dead. You have a power in you that the enemy trembles with and he runs from. Let go of that grudge this morning. Let go of that bitterness. Let go of that anger. Leave the shame behind you. No matter what you've done in your past, leave the shame behind you because Jesus has called you. Pick up your mat and go home. You may be saying, Pastor Clay, I don't have enough strength this morning. That's a good place to start. Because God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul would say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The end of your strength this morning is the beginning of his. When you march six laps around the walls and they don't fall, march the seventh and believe that God can bring down the walls. All right? When it doesn't make sense to the natural world, still follow him. When all hell is breaking loose around you, trust in his sovereign plan. When you are crippled by confusion, seek, ask, knock. When it feels like hope has disappeared, remember his promises. When you feel like you're in the desert and are so thirsty that you can't go on, drink deeply of the living water. When you feel spiritually hungry, feast on the bread of life. Pray until something changes. Say within yourself, I will do whatever it takes to bring them to Jesus. Whatever it takes. Whatever the cost, no matter what they say, no matter what they feel, I have been called, I have been commissioned, I have been commanded, and I will see this through by his spirit. Until God's kingdom comes, until his will is done in my life, I'm leaving every excuse behind. I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm taking up my cross and I'm following the one who never stops short, who never surrenders, who said he'll never leave me nor forsake me. He came and he conquered. He died and he rose again. Trust again, give again, change again, expect again, rejoice again, fight again. And in Jesus' name, when he tells you to walk and leave your mat, rise again, church, rise again. For the battle is not yours, but it's God's. He says, not by my pow- not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. There is no one that he can't save. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Take up your mat and come home, O prodigal son and daughter. You've been set free. You've been forgiven. You've been healed. You've been redeemed. You've been reconciled. You've been rescued. You've been restored. You've been called. You have a new purpose. He's the author and the finisher of your future and your faith. All things are started and sustained by his grace. He's never failed. He's never faltered. He's never wavered. He's never lost. And he's not about to start now. 
just like this man who met Jesus, when you meet Jesus, he changes the way you walk for the rest of your life. We are all somebody here this morning that can be changed. The scripture says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It says, so who the Son sets free is free indeed. It says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this is what we're going to do this morning as we end. Cammie's going to play, and I ask you to do what the Spirit of God is leading you to do. Don't quench him. If you can sing these songs, and that's where your heart is, stand up and sing them. If you want to pray, come pray. The altars were open this morning. People were coming and praying and saying, listen, I, I have family and friends who don't know Jesus. I want them to come. If you feel led to do that, come. If you need prayer, come. We don't want to quench what the Spirit is doing in this moment. You just be obedient.